first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for this special event. And for those of you who were able to see the film yesterday. Before we begin our program, I would like to say something. I would like to express my condolences to the loved ones of Raphael Ben Eliyahu, Asher Natan, Shaul Chai, Ilya Sozansky, Irina Korolova, Eli Mizrahi, and Natalie Mizrahi, the seven people who were killed in a terrorist attack, and the five wounded in the two terrorist attacks in the past two days in Jerusalem. Thank you to our partners, Beth Torah, Beth Emmett, and Beth Shalom. Thank you to the Israeli Affairs Committee, who are Merle Goldman, Shirley Ann Haber, Howard Price, Arthur Zalev, Marcia Zalev, Gail Kurtzman, and Daniel Nurgitz for his behind the scenes work. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ido Netanyahu, who is an Israeli playwright, author, and physician. He grew up in Israel and the United States and did his military service in Sayeret Matgal, the famed special services unit. He is a veteran of the Yom Kippur War. Among his books, Yoni's Last Battle, an account of the 1976 Entebbe rescue, Itamar K, a political and social satire of Israel, and a book of short stories, The Rescuers. His plays have been shown worldwide, including New York, Tel Aviv, Russia, and Italy. His most recent play, Don Samuel Abra. Abra Vanel was recently awarded the President of Warsaw Prize. Dr. Netanyahu lives in Jerusalem and divides his time between writing and working as a physician, in particular, a radiologist, correct? Well, that's the only thing I know. So, sure. <laughs> so welcome, Ido. Welcome. Thank you. Glad and to be I'll here. turn Thank it you. over to you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I just, uh, first of all, before I start my, uh, my talk, I'd like to say that um, what um, the talk will be about in Tebe. That's what I was asked to give a talk about. That's uh, what I researched. And uh, the research uh, is based on uh, numerous testimonies. I interviewed many, many of the participants, especially from the unit uh, about the raid. I collected the information. Many of them I interviewed more than once and more than twice. And finally came out with a book in 19, it was the 15th year to Entebbe. Came out with this book in Hebrew, which later was translated into English and to other languages. It's uh, gonna appear in Spanish in a few months. Uh, and in any case, uh, what you will hear might be very different, very different from whatever, if some of you have read accounts about Entebbe or have seen some documentaries, what I will tell you here uh, might be very different from what you have heard. And uh, that was the reason actually why I started researching the raid. I, uh, 10 years after the raid, in which my brother Jonathan fell, um, certain things started to appear publicly that didn't mesh with what I knew was uh, with the facts. And so uh, because of that, I decided to start collecting the information while people were still alive and while their memory was fairly fresh. Most of it was done 10 years, 11 years after the raid, so for certain things they forgot. But all in all, when you collect all the information and they, they give truthful information, some of them, each person from his own point of view, the truth becomes very clear. The, the facts become very clear. There's no great, it's not uh, very difficult to achieve uh, to arrive at the actual facts and uh, see what actually happened. And so uh, this is what I did, and I published a book. And then uh, 15 years later, I published another book, which is actually a collection of the uh, testimonies with an analysis, and that was called, it's appeared only in Hebrew, called the Seyret Matkal Tebe. So anyway, this is just to give you an introduction and uh, to uh, tell you that uh, what you're about to hear is uh, as far as humanly possible, uh, close to the facts as they occurred. Uh, excuse me, just one second. The, uh, just to, uh, to uh, sort of uh, go over uh, 
the the time that this happened, there was a hijacking on the Sunday, hijacking of an aircraft plane on Sunday. I think it was December 27, 1976. A plane that uh, went from Tel Aviv to Paris and had a stopover in Athens. In Athens, uh, after the plane uh, uh, made its way, started making its way to Paris. Four terrorists hijacked the plane. They got off. And they got on the flight in Athens. Two Palestinian terrorists and two German terrorists, uh, a man and a woman, from the uh, terrorist minor Badhof group. It was a communist uh, terrorist uh, group that was, I think, funded and uh, instigated by Russia or by the Soviet Union at the time. And so they they hijacked the plane. They uh, commandeered it to land in Libya. There, the plane refueled, stopped for a few hours and afterwards made its way south, nobody knew exactly where, until it ended up in Entebbe, landed in Entebbe, Uganda. Entebbe is the airport of Uganda, it's a city also. It lies right at the equator, exactly at the equator, on the north shore of Lake Victoria, this huge lake that is the source of the Nile. And this is where they ended up, early, very early Sunday morning, after a few hours, the hostages were taken off the plane and placed in the old terminal building. This is an old, big terminal, old terminal that the British had built in colonial times, typical British terminal. These, as it turned out, we didn't know that, nobody knew that at the beginning. The Ugandans were in cahoots with the whole thing, including, of course, uh, Idi Amin, the dictator of Uganda. And, uh, but nobody knew that at the time. We'll skip from Sunday, it's, we can mention a few things, but really nothing really happened, nothing of any importance happened between Sunday and Thursday. Um, on, on Thursday, um, the Israeli government headed by Yitzhak Rabin uh, decided to capitulate to the terrorist demands for lack of any alternative. And uh, it announced that it will release the, uh, the terrorists that they're demanding in, in exchange for the lives of the hostages. They were supposed to be executed on Thursday, that Thursday, an hour or two after the government decision. And uh, the uh, terrorists then uh, extended the, the, um, the ultimatum for uh, Sunday. Now, Rabin spoke frankly afterwards. He said, this was not a ruse. This was not an attempt to uh, gain time. We meant to carry out what we decided because there was no other alternative. On Thursday, there was no option at all to release the hostages. And the reason there was no option is very simple. It's because there was no intelligence. Nobody knew what was going on in, in, in Tebe. And if you don't have any intelligence, you cannot plan a military operation. It's impossible. Nobody can. Uh, they knew that the uh, hostages were somewhere in this massive building terminal. They didn't know where in the terminal. They didn't know uh, how many terrorists there were there. They didn't know what guns they had. They didn't know if there were explosives or not. They did not know uh, the status of the Ugandan army. How many, how many soldiers are there? And if there are soldiers there, well, are they foe or the enemy or friend? Are they just there because they have to be there or are they participating with it and will be your enemy when you try to release the hostages? So in lack of any, I mean, there were ideas that were floated around throughout the week, especially Tuesday night, Wednesday, but these were just ideas. There were not any plans of any sort. So that was the government decision on Thursday. But that morning, things changed before the government decision. What happened is that the terrorists decided to release most of the hostages and fly them to Paris in two groups. Wednesday afternoon and Wednesday night, they flew to Paris. Uh, initially uh, in Entebbe, the terrorists uh, separated the 250 some uh, hostages into two groups. Smaller group was that of Israelis, Israeli citizens, and several Jews who were not Israeli citizens, but who 
uh, were obviously Jewish. They wore uh, the Jewish garb or had beards or whatever. And uh, that was 106 hostages in the small hall. And the rest of the hostages were in the large hall. And those are the ones that were released. Less than 106, I'm sorry, around 90. And the rest were those that were released, except for the French crew. The French um, pilot, Michel Bacos, an extraordinary man, told the hostages, told the terrorists that he does not, he will not leave. He and his crew will not leave until the last of the hostages is released. And he got the agreement of all the crew, of the stewardesses, everybody. It goes to show you what uh, true leadership can do. Now he was, a, he himself, by the way, was a pilot in World War II, uh, a French pilot in the uh, Free French Forces. An extraordinary man who was obviously very brave and uh, tremendous integrity. He passed away recently. Uh, and uh, so altogether, uh, at Entebbe, there were 106 hostages left there. And what happened with the release of the, all, all the other hostages is that finally information could be gleaned about what's happening at the table. And for that, a special envoy was sent uh, from Israel to Paris Thursday morning. I arrived there around noon until he got to see the hostages. It took time. Somewhere in the evening, he started interviewing the hostages and getting the information. But even before that, we knew that Idi Amin was cooperating with the hostages, that the Ugandan army is a hostile army. So any idea of bringing in a tiny force and just killing off the terrorists and then just taking flight, you know, a commercial flight back to Israel with the hostages was out of the question. You had to move in with a force that is able to extricate everybody. And so, uh, and so with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the information started coming in, more detailed information uh, started coming in, which enabled, once the information comes in, to create a plan of sorts, to release the hostages. And this is what happened. Uh, the person who was really the one who uh, pushed for a military operation was the deputy chief of staff, Yikuti El Adam. He unfortunately uh, was killed in the war in Lebanon in 1982. And uh, he was the one who pushed forward uh, with the consent of the defense minister, Shimon Peres. Uh, so at 8, 8 p.m. on Thursday, Yoni and some of his staff got the order from the person who was uh, uh, listed to be the commander of the ground forces, Brigadier General Dan Shomron. Uh, who was the, what's called the head of the infantry and paratroopers. Uh, and he got the order to prepare the unit for an operation. Uh, the unit will be responsible for taking over the old terminal, the surrounding area, fighting the terrorists, releasing the hostages and fighting the Ugandan army, and then taking them back uh, to, back to an evacuation, evacuation plane. And various ideas were raised by Dan Shamon. The ideas that had been raised before, one of them was to uh, drop rubber uh, dinghies into Lake Victoria and uh, use both the unit and the naval commando to infiltrate the airport. Uh, another one was to drop parachute, uh, a whole force uh, close to the airport and make its way to the airport. Another one was to land a massive force of Hercules planes. I think he talked about 17 planes to land at the airport itself. That's what the idea that the Air Force actually was first thought of. If they can land straight on the, uh, the uh, airport, nobody will notice anything until they figure out what's happening. Everything is already taken care of. So with these ideas, he only went back to the unit and at 10 p.m. on Thursday, started with some of his uh, staff to plan the operation or the unit's part of the operation. There were other units involved. We talked about Thursday, 10 p.m. The operation itself occurred midnight Saturday, between Saturday and Sunday. And the force took off from a, a Lira airport, a Ben-Gurion airport, a early afternoon on Saturday. We have a very short time 
in which to prepare the forest, to, to create a plan, to prepare the forest and to convince everybody that this is doable and will succeed. Um, now at that time at 10 p.m. he could not really plan the full operation because he did not yet have the information about the terminal itself. He could only, uh, what they concentrated on initially in the first two hours was the approach. First of all, he scuttled the idea of 17 planes. And what the unit needed was four planes, three planes for the force of the unit and another plane for the evacuation. And that's indeed the number of planes that flew to Entebbe. And uh, the idea was that the plane will land, the first plane will carry vehicles, three vehicles that will simulate as if some sort of Ugandan force, a police force, something. Until they came up with the idea, you know what, this will be Idi Amin himself, the presidential, the president with his entourage is coming to visit the hostages at night. Because it was known that he would visit the hostages sometimes. And so the idea, okay, we, what we can get is a Mercedes, stretch Mercedes, the Israeli uh, uh, authorities have plenty of those, and two Land Rover SUVs, which are of the type that is used by the Ugandan army and the Ugandan police as well. And we will disguise ourselves as Ugandans with uh, Yoni being uh, Idi Amin, supposedly. Okay, <laughs> that was the idea. Uh, and uh, I won't go into all the details, but that was the basic idea. At around midnight, Yoni convened the officers of the unit for the first time and told them about the idea for the operation. And many of them, most of them heard about this for the first time. They didn't know about this. They were involved in other things during the week, most of them. Yoni himself was involved in two operations, supervising two operations in the Sinai during that week. Uh, Wednesday night, they came back and they, they had an operation that Yoni did not sleep, of course, during that night. And it was very tired. And so were some of them. Uh, so he gave them instructions of what to prepare for uh, during the night and what to uh, what to prepare, I see. So he, uh, he gave him instructions of what to prepare during the night and the uh, timetable for the following day until a grand rehearsal that will be seen by the chief of staff, Mordechai Gu, the following night. So they had 24 hours really to prepare everything for the grand rehearsal in which the chief of staff will decide is this a go or will he recommend this operation to the government or not? Now, I don't know of any officer in that meeting who thought Thursday night that this operation would actually happen. None of them believe that it will be approved, whether by the chief of staff or the government. Anyway, uh, Thursday night, Yoni, after this meeting, came back to his office. And then he started planning the actual takeover of the terminal building, mostly alone by himself, worked at it for a few hours. Information was filtering all the time from Paris. All the time information came in. He gave a whole list of things he wanted to know. A few years ago, they found in the unit his notebook with what he wrote down about the things he wants to know from Paris. And uh, this is a... He finally, after he had everything ready for the briefing the following morning, the, the grand briefing for the whole force, he went to sleep at home, must have slept, went to his girlfriend, Buya, who was living with him. He must have slept maybe, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half, possibly, came back to the unit Friday. And a uh, whole set of meetings, first of all, with Dan Shambhuan to present this plan and then a grand briefing of the entire force, 60 some people in the unit, and then the rehearsals inside the unit. Very quick, everything was done, condensed. There was no time to really prepare very much and information also kept on flowing in. So they had to change the plan from time to time. It is really a remarkable story. It's an unbelievable story. And so uh, he also had to go, we went a few times to the main uh, headquarters of the army in Tel Aviv uh, for uh, meetings with higher ups. 
including a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting he had with the defense minister, Shimon Peres. Peres wanted to know from him whether uh, this is feasible or not. It's very rare, I actually never heard it, that the defense minister calls a, um, a, um, a person of Yoni's rank, Lieutenant Colonel, for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I think Peres did not want Yoni to be pressured by, uh, or thought he might be pressured by anybody, any high ranking officer. And he wanted to know from him, you know, is this real or not? I also found out not too long ago, uh, what Dayan told about this. He mentioned in one of his interviews, Moshe Dayan was then a private citizen, but Perez used to consult with him about military matters. So on that Friday, Perez came to Dayan told him about the idea for the raid and asked him, what do you think? And Dayan, these are his words, Dayan's words. He said, I told him that if the head of the Air Force thinks it can be done, and if Yoni, as the head of the unit, says he will succeed, then I think you can, you should, you should go for it. And Dayan knew Yoni from uh, the previous years when he was defense minister. And uh, he also, in his book, uh, uh, his own biography, he mentions uh, Yoni under a, fall, uh, a name, fabricated name, because at that time Yoni's name was secret, about his exploits in the Yom Kippur War. Uh, he had uh, apparently a good assessment of people. And Yoni met with Perez. It was a meeting that lasted maybe half an hour and told him, explained to him why he thinks this operation will succeed. Once again, I won't go into the details of what was said. And uh, this, of course, had its effect. There's no question about it. That's what Paris says, if it had, it had its effect. Uh, we're jumping now to Thursday night. Uh, the chief of staff came to see the grand rehearsal. Uh, and after the rehearsal, he convened uh, the officers of the various forces, the commanders of the various forces, whether it's the head of the Hercules squadron, Shani, Yoni, Dan Shimon, of course, is the commander of the ground forces, and people from uh, the Golani Brigade and the uh, Paratroopers Brigade would participate. And ask each one, are you for it or not? And the person he spoke to most was with uh, Yoni, of course, as the commander of the uh, most vital force there, the one that will actually carry out the mission. And uh, once again, Yoni told him that he thinks that this will succeed, explained to him why he thought it would succeed. And uh, the chief of staff, Mordechai Gu, who was very hesitant about the whole idea of the operation, uh, over the course of that day, and maybe because of the what happened transpired that evening, changed his mind and told the officers there that he's going to recommend it to the government. Uh, that was around one o'clock at night, Friday night. The force is supposed to leave the following morning to the airport. A word filtered in the unit to the men that the chief of staff is going to recommend this. They didn't believe he would. They think that he would brush it, brush it off. And uh, several of the officers in the unit who took part in the raid thought that uh, this will end up in catastrophe. And so they gathered together in a room and uh, said that the plan is uh, ridiculous. They thought it was not well prepared. Things were changing. They didn't rehearse enough. And this will end up in disaster, not only for the unit, but for the state of Israel. And they decided that one among them, the son of the famous general, who was also in the cabinet of Yitzhak Abin, he would go to him now in the middle of the night and tell him about the whole thing and tell him what the real situation is. And uh, even though you only gave him an order for nobody to leave the unit, nobody could even make a phone call. Uh, he snuck out of the unit, started driving home and uh, fairly early on stopped in the red light, decided to turn around. 
I don't know why he made that decision, why he changed his mind. Maybe because he thought that, of course, if Yoni would have found out about it, he would be kicked not only out of the unit, he would be kicked out of the army and who knows what. I have no idea. Uh, I, I, still, I, I still don't, I have not interviewed anybody who on Friday, on Saturday morning, that morning, the very morning of the operation, thought that this would be carried out. Well, Yoni went to sleep on Saturday, slept a few hours, called the attache of the chief of staff to find out whether it's still on. And he said, you know, the coded words, he said, yeah, still on, nothing has changed. I was very relieved to hear that. He came to the unit, he heard from one of the, from the commander of those three or four officers that they're very uneasy about the raid. So he convened all the officers and they started a question and answer session for about an hour. What happens here? What's happened there? You only gave answers to everything. And they felt much better afterwards. They felt confident after this uh, session. He understood there was a problem and he, he dealt with it. Anyway, to cut, uh, to make a, a long story uh, short as far as much as I can, uh, they drove to uh, Lod Airport, Ben Gurion Airport, I think it was already called at that time. I'm not sure. And uh, there they boarded the planes. There was another briefing there. It doesn't matter the whole thing. Yoni actually, interesting uh, side note, the commander or the lead pilot of the evacuation plane had been stationed in Uganda several years before. He was there for three years. In effect, he was the head of their air force. And so he knew the terminal, the old terminal very well. And uh, Yoni started asking him about the questions about the terminal, the layout. He still had many, there were still many unknowns. And uh, he remembers that he told them that the entrance, where the entrance, Yoni was very concerned about how to get very quickly to the top floor where the Ugandan hour was. Because the intelligence said there was a big Ugandan force there both surrounding the terminal building and also at night sleeping in the, in the top floor. And you had to get to the top floor very quickly because there was a door there that uh, overlooked the entire, the large hostage hall. And so uh, he uh, told them that he told him that's not, this is not the entrance where you think it is. This is, this is the staircase, the staircase to the top floor. Uh, he also asked him about Ugandan sentries, how they react. Uh, and he told them, it doesn't matter what they see, whether they think you're reading or not, they're told, and they go by the orders, they're told that any vehicle approaching, especially there in this highly, you know, uh, <laughs> very tense area, uh, they will demand that you stop, and if you don't stop, they'll shoot you. There's no question about it. He said there's no ifs or buts, that's how they act. Anyway, they uh, land, they boarded the planes, they flew first to uh, the Sinai at that time, Half the Sinai Desert was still in our hands, including the airfield at Sharm el Sheikh, the southern tip of the Sinai. They refueled there. All this time, the government was in session, debating whether to approve the raid or not. Now, they had to leave at a certain hour in order to make it to Entebbe at midnight. And so they got the approval to uh, lift off from Sharm el Sheikh. And if the government decides, that they don't have the approval, they will simply go back, turn around and land back in Israel. <laughs> Excuse me. Before they took off, Yoni uh, gave them a, uh, a briefing. Uh, I'd like to uh, read to you something that one of the soldiers wrote. 40 years after the raid, a book was published finally, by the men of the unit who got tired of hearing all the false stories and all the false books and everything. Why they waited 40 years, I don't know. But then they decided, okay, we'll publish a book. Each one of us gives his recollections of the raid, the preparations and the raid itself. And that book, by the way, it's called in Hebrew, it's called Yifsa Yonatan Begufrishon, in English as uh, Operation Jonathan at first person, I guess a better translation would have been first person singular. And it was published, a uh, digital publication also in English, I think recently. 
And uh, I'd like to read to you what one of the soldiers says about the uh, Yoni's final briefing in the desert in Sharm el Sheikh. I translated this into English. A short while before the flight, the continuing flight, Yoni gathers all of us. His words will not be forgotten from the hearts of all who were present. These were the words of a veteran commander to his soldiers who are departing to a place from which no one knows how and if he will return, encouraging us and persuading us that we are the strongest and most trained force there, together with his belief in our abilities, the things that soldiers need to hear before such an operation. They boarded the planes, the first plane with the Mercedes and the two Land Rover Jeeps, 30 soldiers, 30 some 32 soldiers of the unit, some soldiers of the paratroopers, and the other two planes uh, carrying uh, APC carriers also from the unit, 30 more soldiers who were supposed to uh, join the uh, lead force seven minutes later and give them cover. Those are the three planes carrying the men of the unit. The planes took off, they flew, they flew very low a few yards above sea level in order to, not to be detected by radar. Once they entered the I think, uh, airspace of Sudan, there were no radars there and they could, they rose up and flew high up and they made their way to Lake Victoria. Night uh, settled, people went to sleep. Johnny was extremely tired. He went to sleep in the pilot's cabin, one of those bunk beds, and asked to be woken up half an hour before the landing which they did. They woke him up and he went back, woke up some of his people. They all got in place in their Jeeps with the guns and the uh, vests and everything ready. And before landing, he went among them. He went on top of the Jeeps, there was no room anywhere else and shook their hands and uh, sort of uh, joked with them a little bit, sort of releasing them before the operation, told them that They'll do fine. And then got into the, uh, the Mercedes, into the seat next to the driver. Uh, before that, they had so seen that the airport, that the landing lights were still there. They could land with lights, at least the first plane could. So the plane landed. The first to get out of the plane were several paratroopers who were carrying a small uh, light to put to place next to the airport, the, the runway lights, in case they turn off the runway lights, that the next plane could land with, with their help. The plane stopped near, near the new terminal that's on the designated spot. The three vehicles got out quickly and uh, made their way with the Mercedes at the lead, full lights. Idi Amin coming with his entourage. Uh, made their way through the airport and uh, then the, through side runway, the lead runway, another side runway, and they could see the old terminal far away in the distance. About 200 yards before the old terminal, two guards appear at the exact same spot where you only put two Ugandan, as if Ugandan guards, in the rehearsal. The routine was that they if the guards, of course, would pass them by, leave them alone, that's fine, who cares? If the guards insist that they stop and uh, identify themselves, they would need to, uh, to uh, neutralize them. Uh, the guards, uh, well, the lead guard sort of aimed his uh, rifle, cocked it, aimed it, Stog and shouted uh, whatever it is they shout and make it halt or whatever. I don't know what word, but it was obvious that he wanted them to stop and uh, identify themselves, as Yoni was told that they would do. So they uh, Yoni told the driver slow down, you know, veer towards him a little bit as if you're going to identify. And once they were opposite him uh, from the right side, Yoni with his pistol with a silencer and. Uh, uh, one of the officers who sat in the back of Yoni shot at this guard. They hit him, 
but he was not uh, fully uh, neutralized. And then a uh, loud fire was heard. Uh, some of the men thought it was the guard who opened fire. Some of the men thought it was the other guard. And some of the men, especially those in the Jeep, thought it was the guys from the Jeep. Uh, those in the Mercedes thought it was the guys from the Jeep who opened fire on the guard because he wasn't killed. In any case, both of them had to be killed at that moment. Because the, besides the threat of being shot at, and there, you have to realize each of the Land Rovers was filled with 11 people, okay? It was like a pack of people driving, okay? There were totally any, anybody could spray bullets and kill many of them. But more importantly, they could shout, run and shout to the uh, soldiers and the terrorists in the terminal building what was happening once they realized what force this is. Indeed, that's what the second guard tried to do. And as he was running forward towards the building, he was uh, cut down. The minute loud shouts were heard, Yoni uh, told the driver to uh, pick up speed tremendously. Uh, they drove for another 200 uh, meters. He told him to stop not at the designated spot, but just before that, uh, so that the control tower would uh, hide the force. Uh, and uh, that's where they got off. They got off, they started walking quickly towards the terminal building. Everything was quiet. No shots, okay. it's opposite to what you might have read or might hear. Total silence, no shots, nothing. Apparently the terrorists, you know, people heard those faraway shots. They didn't know exactly what was going on. The terrorists thought that the Ugandans went crazy, started shooting, nobody knew. Uh, they started walking quickly as they were supposed to do towards the terminal building. And all of a sudden the guy, the lead, it was, it was supposed to be at the lead, you're only supposed to be just behind him. Started spraying fire, started shooting, not even single rounds, but bursts, which you never do in this kind of operation. And then as he got to the corner of the building, he took cover and started shooting forward. Nobody knows it what. And the whole attack stopped in its track. Uh, people didn't understand why he stopped, what was happening. They knew that it's seconds before the terrorists realized what's happening and start executing the hostages. And uh, Yoni shouted this person several times to go forward. He did not budge, this officer. And uh, people realized that Yoni is against this halt, that he's angry. Uh, the minute he stopped shooting forward, as if to replace the magazine, uh, Yoni ran forward and the rest of the force followed. They ran towards their entrances, each force towards their entrances. The second in command of the unit, Yiftach Reiche, went to the first entrance uh, from which the hall led to the second floor. That was his mission to get quickly to the second floor, especially to that door that uh, is like sort of a semi balcony that overlooks the main term, the main hall. Uh, they kept, they started running forward. Uh, at a certain point, uh, two or three of the men bypassed Yoni. He was running a bit more slowly, uh, overseeing the men. And the first person in line was a guy, a soldier from Jerusalem called Amir Ophel, who actually thought that his commander was running without him, that his commander was already ahead of him and didn't want his commander to enter the hall by himself. So he ran forward very, very quickly. He remembered what Yoni said in the briefing at Sharm el-Sheikh that they have to think only of one thing, how to get as quickly as possible to the hostages. It's if things will not occur uh, according to plan, it's always that way. You have to remember the, the uh, purpose of the mission and you have to use your common sense and act accordingly. And he said, this is what passed through my mind. I knew that I had to get to, the, to, the, to my entrance. He ran to the second entrance of the main hall and uh, shots were already being fired from the hall at him. And uh, as he was running towards his door, he saw the terrorist lying on the ground inside, shooting at him or shooting outside. 
he shot him and he hit him while running. He entered, uh, now just before that, maybe a second before that, he heard somebody cry, Yoni was hit. Yoni was hit probably when he was opposite the first door of the main hall, somewhere there. Uh, hit in the chest and in the arm. So he was probably hit by a, uh, not a single shot, by several shots and maybe uh, automatic uh, fire. Hit by Kalachnikov. The terrorists all received Kalachnikovs in the morning of the raid, actually, that Saturday morning. The only ones who had Kalachnikov were the unit soldiers and the terrorists. The Ugandans had other so other other weapons in that. Those who were stationed in, in the airport had other weapons. He shot, he was shot, he hit the ground. Uh, Amil heard Yoni is shot. And anyway, he entered, he entered the main hall, uh, gave another bullet to the, it was a German terrorist, uh, shot to make sure that certainly he was uh, totally neutralized and dead. And immediately behind him, followed him, his commander, okay? His commander, uh, Amnon Pellet, um, who apparently realized that the person who was supposed to enter the first entrance to this main hall did not enter it. So he instinctively turned left instead of turning right where he's supposed to in order to cover that part of the hall. And as he turned left, he saw two terrorists crouching, a man and a woman who were aiming their rifles at the soldier, at Amir, about to shoot him. He shot them, killed them. And then afterwards, everybody, several other soldiers and officers entered from that second entrance, including the person who stopped at the, who had stopped, who was supposed to lead the assault. Uh, they stood, Amir was assigned, uh, the guy who shot the German terrorist who entered first, was assigned with a bullhorn. He took it out and spoke in English and in Hebrew. Uh, we're at the IDF, we came here to rescue you. Lie down, everybody lie down. And they were standing in line, looking, and all of a sudden one of the terrorists jumps up and another guy from Jerusalem he raised his rifle. Amos raised his rifle and uh, shot him in the chest and killed him. With that, the four terrorists who were uh, threatening the lives of the hostages were killed. Uh, three of the hostages were shot. One of them, a young guy, Jean-Jacques Maimoni, jumped up and uh, it was killed by friendly fire. There's no question about that. Two others were shot, we're not certain if they were killed by the terrorists or by uh, Israeli fire. Uh, one of them was still alive, he made it to uh, Kenya, but died there at the hospital. Uh, anyway, with that, I would say those seconds, it took maybe, I don't know, 15 seconds. With that, the threat to the lives of the hostages was over. I won't go into the rest of the operation. There are other details, uh, not that important. Uh, they had to, they destroyed the MiG planes that were there. Yoni was still alive. He was still, uh, very, let's see, not really conscious, but uh, the, um, the doctor took care of him uh, when there were loud uh, bursts of fire coming either from the control tower. Now the control tower started to spray fire or the bursts of the MiG planes. He made a movement of getting up, but he was losing blood very quickly. At a certain point in time, he was evacuated to the evacuation plane where there was a team of doctors. They tried to resuscitate him to no avail and he, he passed away at Entebbe. Uh, this, uh, in short, is the description of the operation. And uh, I maybe want to finish off with, uh, once again, quoting another one, another person from the unit, Amir Ophel, this guy who was the first to enter the, the main hostage hall. 
And this is what he wrote in his memoirs 40 years after Entebbe. And uh, maybe it's not necessary, but still uh, in order to, for you to understand that I'm not making any of this up, even though it's quite different from what you might have heard and what you will hear. Anyway, this is what Amir Ofer says in the book, in the memoirs. Throughout the preparations that I took part in, Yoni led them. He's the one who carried out upon his shoulder the burden of responsibility to stay before those of the highest ranks and his subordinates will do it. When around him, there were those, not just one or two, who weren't sure of it. The final briefing he gave us at Charm el-Sheikh was a masterpiece of thought, the best pre-operational briefing I've ever heard. The way he conducted himself during the mission was superb. He made the right decision to open fire upon the guards. He made the right decision to then accelerate the vehicles. He made the right decision to disembark a little before the planned spot. And he was aware of Muki's halt and gave the right orders to solve the problem. Now, Amir didn't see this, but Yoni also went forward himself. That's what others say, those who were there next to Yoni. Yoni was probably the first one out of the corner of the building. Regarding its results, I'm still not quoting from Amir. Regarding its results, this was possibly the most dramatic and important moment in all the history of the IDF. The lives of a hundred hostages was on the line. That a few seconds left before the sand in the hourglass ran out. And all this was done in a hostile and foreign faraway land. The ramifications of failure here went far beyond the loss and lives, the lives of the hostages and soldiers. It's hard to imagine the damage to the state of Israel and the damage to the IDF's deterrence. Confronting all this was a small force, greatly inferior in number to the enemy, a force that was supposed to succeed through surprise and its individual's superiority. And Yoni, whose shoulders bore this horrible responsibility, and only his shoulders bore it. And in the most stressful situation one can imagine, during that moment was focused, purposeful, read the situation well, and reacted to it exactly as he should have, a real commander. A terrible injustice was done to him in some of the descriptions of the operation. Let me stress that what I say here is not said because he was killed in order to speak well of the dead, none of that. It is said in order to correct the historical distortion that was caused him with regard to this operation and to give deep thanks to a man who fell while on assignment for the state of Israel in a mission that is more just than any, while carrying it out in the best way possible, making the right decisions, and being a major factor in its overall success. And with that, I finish my uh, my little talk. And uh, I don't know if there's time for any questions, but uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer at least some of them. Thank you so much. I, I have a question for you. The Entebbe has affected all of us, Jews worldwide. Um, Jews, people in Israel, no doubt, no question. However, sometimes I think that gets lost in, in all of that is the personal loss to, for your family and the fact that you lost your brother. How did that fundamentally, if it did, change your relationship with, with Israel, for example, because you were a family of Sayyarit Matgal, but you were a family, and then it kind of exploded who you were as a family. Am I making sense? I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the family because remained a family. Look, Yoni, Yoni the family became, remained a family, but the relationship no, but Yoni, with Israel Yoni changed. Became, Yoni became very famous, not because of Antebi, by the way, mostly through his book of letters. The book of, we decided to publish the book of letters. It had a tremendous impact. Uh, on you know, Israeli youth and others. Uh, when did we publish it? I don't know, 40 some years ago, 45 years ago. 
or is it 44? I don't think it's been ever out of print in Hebrew. It's still being uh, sold every year. I know that for a fact because I get the statements. Um, and uh, uh, when the books, when the book came out, it made a huge, huge impression. Of course, when he was known because of Entebbe, but his fame, I would say, was a result of uh, of his own words. Uh, you know, there was a, when the book came out in English. Uh, George Will wrote an interest, something interesting. He said, uh, "Not you only read the letters." He said, "Not you only was Yoni and Achilles." He is his own Homer. Interesting idea. So Yoni became famous, and uh, to what extent this changed my life? Well, first of all, I had to do the research. I had no choice. <laughs> Truth is, we we did not investigate about Entebbe at all. I was not concerned with it. We didn't really care that much. We knew what we knew, and that was it. But once the falsifications started coming in, I felt I had to do the research. My father actually started it. But uh, but when I finished my resident training in America, came to Israel, I continued with it, re-interviewed those, a few that I interviewed, and then continued with the rest. And the, there's no question uh, Yoni's death affected my life. I, maybe I became a writer because of that. I know that after his death, I decided to take a year off from medical school, think my way. I then returned to medical school, but I don't know if it was because of that or just because I was felt that intellectually uh, medicine is not enough, stimulating enough for me. Maybe, I don't know. I went out to become a writer plus doing medical work. Um, that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> it's a great answer. <laughs> it's a great answer. So um, does anybody else have any questions? You can drop them in the chat, happy to, or you can raise a hand and uh, I'll unmute you. Uh, Rivka? Yes. It's Gail, I see uh, some messages. Um, what were the false stories that have come out? Oh, endless. Endless falsifications about the planning of the operation. Supposedly the plan it was planned uh, days before, and that Yoni came, arrived from the Sinai late on Thursday, and received a ready-made plan. Uh, that he took no part in the planning. Uh, he took no part in the uh, preparations of the soldiers uh, on the Friday, uh, and that. Uh, his part in the raid itself, that he made errors in the raid. He should not have shot at the guards. This created havoc. And that he fell, uh, he did not even run forward. He was, uh, he was actually st st stayed next to the control tower and he was shot by them. And he basically nearly botched up the raid and also uh, took no part in it, no meaningful part in it. Uh, you want me to continue? I can continue more, but I don't want to. That's uh, enough what you heard. Uh, these are all uh, false stories, unfortunately, uh, and you can see why I had no choice but to uh, get the information on tape, write what I did, then write an 800-page book of testimonies, for God's sakes. And then, uh, luckily, finally, the soldiers of the unit, 40 years after the raid, wrote their book, uh, which corroborates everything that I wrote. It doesn't mean these false stories are not circulating. The, the main problem, I would say, the main problem was that the uh, military uh, unit, the military history division, uh, wrote an account of the raid. And uh, the account was done, and they interviewed some people. And the writer, that they also interview the unit except that they interviewed only one person from the unit, the same one who was supposed to lead the raid and stopped. It was in effect the deputy commander 
for the operation, not the pre-commanded unit, but for the operation. He was the only one they interviewed. Now, what is strange here is that they, they also added their hands the, uh, the, the commanders of the teams wrote post-op reports, very brief reports, which would describe what happened. They had those in their hands, yet they preferred in their report to relate what this person said to what they had in these reports. And they had to choose because they did not mesh up. Okay, either he was true or they were true. For some reason, they decided to disregard these reports. And this was used, okay, the army did this official investigation supposedly, and uh, this was leaked to uh, different various reporters. It would leak to people who wrote uh, books about it. And the definitive, this is the secret definitive report of the raid, but uh, what it describes about the unit's role in the raid, I found there one sentence that was fully accurate. The rest was, the rest was either false or gibberish. And, but that was a tool for enhancing the falsification of the raid. This is a very ugly story in Israel's history, unfortunately. And, uh, and uh, of course, the newspapers and the Israeli media enhanced it as much as they could. And to the extent that I wrote occasionally uh, articles that uh, attacked various false stories that appeared, I was ignored. So even though I quote what people say from the unit, I was ignored. But this is Israeli media, that's the way it is. Uh, maybe it's true of Western media in general. So I have a question for you. So what purpose did these falsifications serve? What, what, what's your thinking behind that? Well, the, the one person who, uh, who uh, was the mostly responsible for uh, telling these stories. First of all, I wanted to cover up for his own uh, mistakes, or whatever you want to call them, but also with time, wanted to enhance his role, okay? And some people are pathological liars, what can you do? Sure. Uh, I can quote you another thing that uh, Alex Davidi said in the book. This is not Amir, this is Alex Davidi. Uh, uh, Muki Betzer is the one who, since the end of the operation, for 40 years hence, is involved with fitting history to his personal narrative, putting him at the crux of the operation and its success while disregarding the simple facts that are clear to the vast majority of the unit's fighters who took part in the raid. Uh, right after the operation and the years following, some adoptive fathers, in quotes, arose and took ownership of the ideas the planning and the actual running of the operation, not, not only him, by the way, the time you hear, everybody was involved in planning the units part of the room, right? Some officers were planning other parts of the raid, that's fine, not the unit. But to me and my buddies who took part in the operation, it was clear who the real biological father is. The late Yonatan Netanyahu, who to our sorrow is not with us to defend his name and his part in the operation. His fingerprints and footprints were clear at every stage that we are witness to. From the beginning, from the very beginning until the end of the operation, and to our regret also the end of his life. Uh, anyway, so uh, for this person, why he did it, you have to ask him. I, fair enough. He won't tell the truth. Now, the bigger question, look, you have people like that everywhere, I guess. Unfortunately, he was also a member of the unit. That's pretty rare. Uh, the bigger and more problematic question is, why did the press join forces with him all these years? You, it's enough for a third rate reporter, if he starts investigating the facts, to, to understand that what he's saying is false. It's enough for him to compare one interview that he has with another and to realize this guy is a pathological liar. In one interview, he says that he killed all the terrorists in the world. Another one, he killed, well, he killed just one of them. 
Then another one, he killed two of them, but they're in a different part of the room. The fact is, he killed none of the terrorists. And, uh, and he, uh, but that's just part of it. I mean, it's it really anybody with any kind of sense who wants to arrive at the truth uh, can take not, he doesn't have to interview anybody. <laughs> all, he can, all he has to do is see the statements that came out and understand very quickly. But none of the writers who wrote books and uh, none of the reporters, lead, the, lead, the lead commentators in Israel all attacked me, of course, at the Netanyahu family. Uh, it's, of course, it's a conspiracy on the part of the Netanyahu family, defaming people, whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, trying to glorify their, uh, their brother or their son where it does not deserve. Uh, this is this is the uh, this is I would say the, the big problem I would say much more disturbing than the fact that uh, somebody lies so many times about something these things happen such people occur in society in all countries and all peoples. I have a question. Um... What did you, uh, you know, there were several Hollywood movies made about the, the raid. Did you have any feelings about them or any, any reactions to seeing them or, or hearing about them? I never saw them, so I can't have any reaction. Uh, look, Hollywood movies are Hollywood movies, you know. They, I don't think they pretended to really uh, have the facts. Right. My other question is, I, I just don't know, um, after the raid, were details kept like very secret about Yoni or was he publicly commemorated or what? what no, no, he was, no, no, he was publicly commemorated. Absolutely. I mean, the whole, everybody and his uh, sister came to the funeral. Uh, Perez gave a very eloquent eulogy, unbelievable eulogy. Uh, but everybody was there, whether it was Yitzhak Rabin in Paris, uh, Begin, who was the head of the opposition, uh, chief of staff. Uh, and uh, uh, no, Yoni was held in high regard. Uh, the falsifications really occurred many years later, uh, or some years later. They started appearing three years later, but the main falsifications occurred 10 years later. Uh, is so you're asking, uh, forgive me, I, I forgot the question, but uh, the main question, what was it? Well, I, I just wondered, um, like after the raid, if he was publicly commemorated or if there were too many things that were kept secret because it was, you know, uh, a secret mission or... It was not a secret mission. It was one of, you know, the, 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 the special unit has many missions that are secret to this day. Virtually all of them are secret. But it has some uh, some things that it does that are not secret. And this is one of those operations that were not secret. The role of the Mossad is kept secret. We, all we know is that a Mossad agent flew to Entebbe. The main problem before the operation, that the main problem of the chief of staff was that, okay, what is the size of the Ugandan force? And is there a large force surrounding the terminal building? Because that's information that they got from the hostages. And he said, if there's a large force of Ugandans surrounding the building, I'm not going to put the operation. And uh, they sent the Mossad agent to take photographs, to be there. And he landed actually at the airport, uh, sort of he pretended to be a private pilot or whatever, had some mechanical problems. And the uh, pictures, the photos came in uh, Saturday morning as they were about to leave. Before they boarded the plane, Yoni was handed a whole batch of photos. And one of them showed the terminal building very well, the entrances and everything. I have it here. And it showed that there was not this massive Ugandan cordon around the building. Actually, maybe one or two soldiers, that's all. Most of the force was, who knows at that time, who knows where. There were many soldiers in the building at night. Most of them fled, but they were there. And many, many were killed also. Uh, and so this, uh, but how the Mossad did it, who did it, the agent, he's, I know he passed away, but his name is not, still not revealed. So there's certain parts of the uh, operation that have been kept secret, but not, not the unit's part. That is not, was not kept secret. The name of the people who took part, besides Yoni, was kept secret for many years. The names were kept secret. Okay. 
okay, that's a good answer. Um, so it, it really sounded like, you know, if, if it would have been up to someone else, you know, if it was not Yoni, it's possible that the operation may not have taken place. Like it sounded like he was really instrumental in making sure that, that it would happen. I think making sure that it would happen and making sure that it would succeed. I don't know if it would have happened if somebody else had done it. Uh, now, these operations almost invariably fail. These rescue missions, at least that Israel did, almost invariably fail, including the ones of the unit. If you remember Ma'alot, Ma'alot, yeah. were 30 some kids who were killed, done by the unit. Same people. Okay. Not the exact same soldiers. Uh, but uh, uh, now, because the difference between success and failure here hinges on just those critical seconds. From the minute the terrorists understand that there's a hostile force until they're gunned down. What happens in those critical seconds is the most important thing. And it's very scary to enter a room where you, the one entering, are sitting uh, at our target. Okay. You can't just spray fire into the room because you'll be killing the hostages. It's not like entering a room in a regular warfare where you throw a grenade and then after the grenade bursts, you go in and you just spray with bullets. That's scary enough. But to enter a hall where you know there are terrorists there who are looking for you, it takes extraordinary bravery. And by the way, uh, 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 the reason why, and this almost happened here, I mean, besides the halt in the raid, uh, the first door, the main hall where it turned out all the hostages were kept, uh, the unit did not know for sure that they kept in this hall or the other hall where the Israelis had been kept or in two halls. And so they were ready to enter quickly the two halls, the small hall and the large hall. As it was, it turned out they were all in the large hall. But the first door to the uh, hall, was not entered. That same person who was supposed to uh, enter, who led, was supposed to lead the operation, did not enter it. He entered after some other people, the second door. Uh, he was supposed to enter first, and he did not do so. So disaster could have happened. It made of, you know, it's a matter of seconds, really. It doesn't take very long to kill several dozen people with bursts of gunfire and a few hand grenades. Five seconds, it's nothing. And so to what extent Yoni was responsible uh, for the success? Uh, you have your Amir Ofer who thinks he was very responsible for success. You know, had another officer done what Yoni did or even better, it's quite possible, I can't tell you, but we know what he did. And certainly his, what he did was uh, critical both to the, uh, Preparations, I think, and the success, and the also convincing the higher ups to support it. Uh, the manner in which you talk has tremendous power. The manner in which he talked to both Perez and to the chief of staff, not gung ho, but a thoughtful manner, I suspect had a lot in convincing them that uh, they should approve of the raid. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. I just, um, as we wrap up, I would just like to share a quote from Dr. Howard Price, who is one of um, our members and is also the chair of the Israel Affairs Committee. And the quote is, in my mind, Entebbe was one of the great miracles and accomplishments of Israel and left a legacy of demonstrating that every Jew everywhere in the world should be grateful for the creation of the state of Israel, which demonstrated with Antibi that it will do whatever is humanly possible with the help of God to rescue Jews anywhere in the world. So, Dr. Netanyahu, I, I, we thank you so much for sharing the more details about Entebbe and for sharing insight into 
Yoni, your brother's thoughts, actions on that day. We will be forever grateful for your presence here with us at Beth well, Tikva. Thank you very much. And sorry so about again, the thank you. connection, but we got over it. Oh, no worries. <laughs> with the world of Zoom, we're kind of used to that sort of thing. Okay, <laughs> and okay. on behalf of Beth Tikva, we, would, we will be making a donation in Yoni's name to Beit HaLohem. And for those who don't know, that um, is an organization that cares for those soldiers who have been, have been disabled um, and have PTSD. Well, thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. you. Yep. Goodbye, everyone.